I'm going to give a quick overview of MPI and the um, and the MPI forum, inviting, of course, everybody to join the MPI forum because uh, we would like to see more members, of course, in the forum. So we'll do that. Um, for those of you who have been here in the beginning of two weeks, you may some slides may look familiar from my, my previous talk, so it, uh, please ignore that. Um, and then I want to go through the, the standard and kind of show a little bit what we have done lately, what has been added to the standard in MPI 4.0, and what we're planning going forward. And as Claudia already said, I don't have to do this alone because we have um, experts here that are very intimate in the MPI forum, that are leading uh, working groups, are leading certain efforts in there. And of course, I'm going to pass the, the word to them because they're going to talk about their specific topics in a, in a, a much more deeper way than, than I could do that. But to, to start with, I mean, I think this is probably clear, the message passing interface, um, the idea of having a standard that, that allows us to communicate in, in, uh, in shared nothing architectures basically came in the, in, in the early 90s when we started to have these kind of architectures where we had the idea of these, um, these independent nodes connected just via network or without a, sh a shared memory in there. There have been multiple libraries that needed to do that. And so people got together and said, well, how can we do this once and for all? We have these dozen libraries that all do the same thing. Can we just not uh, come together and, and find one standard for that? That's what happened as an MPI in 1994, MPI 1.0 got ratified, started with a very simple way, so it's just certain point to points and certain collectives in there. So a very simple functionality and from there it grew. When you all know that the size of the standard today, we can't print it as a book anymore because we have too many pages for that. Um, so the functionality was added, but the base functionality is still there and you can still write MPI 1.0 programs. If you're interested in more details, all the documents are on the MPI forum webpage. So you can download all the standards, the old ones and the current ones. You can see also all ongoing discussions and ongoing um, debates and what should be in the future standards. So if you're interested in that, please feel, feel free to go on this in the slide. And then also there was a symposium at the 25 year anniversary that was held at Argon, which if you look at the history of MPI, there's some very interesting talks that are available through the website. So if you're interested in looking into that, I highly encourage you to do that. Just real quick before we go into the technical side, so what is the MPI forum? The MPI forum is basically the standardization body for the message passing interface standard. So that's where we discuss what should go in the standard, how we can extend it, where we're going to drive this forward. We're also looking at the, at, at the correctness and the quality of the standards. We lately went to the standard and cleaned up a lot of docu a lot of uh, terminology and things like this just to make us more readable and make it more, more precise. And then, of course, we represent MPI to the community. So you're going to see us at various BOFs and in conferences and talks, and then also organization of, of, of conferences uh, like this. Um, and so there's the forum itself, which is kind of the body, the, the, the overall body. But then the actual work gets done in working groups that are specific to individual topics. And so here's the working groups that we currently have. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you see there's a wide, broad, uh, wide range of topics. And the, um, and, and the matching people to that who are kind of currently run um, these, these working groups. So if you're interested in any of these topics, feel free to contact them directly or contact any of us and we'll be happy to connect you. And then the forum itself has what we call officers, so four officers. In addition to myself, we also have a secretary, that's Wes Bland. We have a treasurer, which is Brian Smith, who made sure that we, we, we can pay for all the food and so on that we had here during the, during the, during the time here. And then Bill Grob is the editor of, of the standard document. Um, what is very really unique, I think, about MPI is it is an open membership model. So if you would like to join the MPI forum, there is no legal document to sign. There is no lawyer to get involved. You just show up at the meetings and you participate in the discussions. You automatically become a member of the MPI forum. Um, if you want to stick with it and you would like to help us to move things forward on, on a regular basis, then you also can become a voting member simply by attending enough meetings. Um, there's a certain rule for that. If you have two of the last three meetings, you can actually vote also on the standard as well. So it's a very low, th low threshold way to, to participate. Um, the voting actually is perhaps not even that important because we really have a lot of discussion to, to do things unanimous. There's been very, very few votes that actually had a really broad discussion or had a really a, a big uh, dissent in there. So we're trying to get this right before we actually standardize that. And so any discussion is, of course, here, here, here very helpful and, and very welcome. Important organizations become member of the MPI forum. And so you have to be associated with an organization, but it also means that if one person can't make it to all meetings, you can just send someone else from the same organization that counts in the same way. You don't have to be always with the same person there. 
Meetings for the forum for the entire forum are held typically four times a year. That can change if we have some special circumstances, but that's the standard. We do two virtual meetings and we do two hybrid ones and one uh, typically with your MPI. So we had one earlier this week. So if you were here earlier already, you saw us huddle in that room back there, uh, look and talk about, talking about the next steps in the, in the MPI standard. And then the working groups do their own, own meetings and they typically meet once a week, every two weeks, uh, typically online as well. So if any of the topics sound interesting to you, or anything that you heard also this week or any ideas that you have for MPI, please join us. It is an open model. We welcome new members all the time, and it would be nice just to see more fresh faces in there. Um, as for MPI itself, let's look a bit at the history of MPI. As I said, the initial MPI was done um, in 1994, but you had the first version of that. It was still very much intended for the single core era, so we had the idea of one MPI process on one node. There weren't any multi-core chips around at this point, right? So we, we had like just these boxes of single core chips put together via network. We had basic communication, so point to point uh, was of course the, the, the main thing that already existed in multiple versions. There was a non-blocking version, a non-blocking version, and even the persistent version was already in the initial standard. And then some simple blocking collectives as well as, as basic data types and already a tools interface back then. So that was kind of one of the very unique things. MPI had a tools interface from the very beginning because it had very good tool support also from the very beginning. A couple of years later, MPI 2.0 came out or the whole series of MPI 2X uh, came out where stuff got merged around. So the first unified standard was actually MPI 2.2 uh, where they had where they had the more generalized concepts. Also remote memory access, what Joseph was talking about before came into, into the standard at this point. Threading support was, was, was retrofitted. We could not deal with different threads because we started to become uh, more cores on individual nodes so that became important at that point uh, and also more complex data types. So it's basically the whole thing grew and a couple of concepts got added. And you can kind of see the number of words also grew over time as well as we, as we added things to the standard. Um, another big step was MPI 3.0 where we added um, non-blocking collectives. So the collectors were initially only blocking because it was too hard back then to implement on the architectures. Nobody wanted to, to go for that because it didn't make sense back then. At the time MPI 3.0 rolled around, architectures had changed, so blocking, non-blocking collectors made sense. Um, RMA was further enhanced. We added Fortran support for Fortran 2008, and also again, more tools interfaces. So again, the, the, the concepts grew. We added on, we refined some things, but the basics still stand, the stand and is still backwards compatible to the MPI 1.0 part. And then this whole thing, the trend, and also continued to MPI 4.0 and 4.1, which happened over the last couple of years. So we published MPI 4.0 in 2021. And I want to go now through a couple of these changes that we did that uh, I think we, would be important to be aware of. If you want to use MPI 4.0, there's some really interesting features in there and some really interesting quirks um, that you probably should know where, where they come from. And one of those quirks is uh, the solution for what we call the big count problem. Uh, if you look at the MPI standard before MPI 4, there's uh, any count arguments, anything when you say I'm wanting to send X number of data types, I want to receive X some, number of data types, that's a count. That was an integer variable. And as an integer variable, we were limited to 32 bits at this time. Um, and with that, you can, uh, you can only send a um, certain amount of messages, right? They're limited by this point. And when they started MPI, that limit seemed far, far away because you would never send that much data in one single message. Of course, as we all know, this has changed with the whole big, big data operations these days that came to a limit. So we're looking for a solution to, to, to do that. And so how can you now do this um, to go beyond just having a 32-bit count? There were some tricks in the beginning that, that kind of worked, but were kind of really cumbersome and looked really stupid at the end. And so we wanted to do to fix this one for all. And it sounds like a very simple issue, right? The idea is how can we just fix it? Well, change the data type to something else. But with that, you kind of invalidate the whole backwards compatibility. You cannot run all codes anymore. That's why we didn't want to do that. So that was definitely bad. Then the next thing we looked at polymorphic bindings that only worked so and so. Actually, in Fortran, it worked really nice in C. We couldn't do that. And so the idea, on the only thing that came that we were able to do at the end is to really duplicate the entire interface. And so since then you will see in the standard both an, an integer and a 32-bit and a, so integer and a 64-bit integer version of, um, of any, kind of any kind of operation that has a count in it. 
And you can kind of identify this by having seeing this underscore C attached to that. I know it's a really ugly solution, but it helped. It was possible with that to maintain backwards compatibility and be able to do to solve what we wanted to do. We choose that last option that went through a whole bunch of changes uh, in, in the standard. It also had some nice side effects on how the standard was written. And if you look at the standard now in the MPI 4 standard, you will see for each of these bindings something like this here. So you have the MPI 3031 version up here, and you have a big count version attached to it, MPI receive and MPI receive underscore C. And in the Fortran part, you have a polymorphic uh, option that allows you to do both at the same time. So you'll see this for every single binding in the standard now that there is a regular and an underscore C option. And of course, depending on what you want to do, I think looking forward, at some point, we're probably going to go more and more just using the underscore C. So if you write new code, it's probably recommended to go with the new versions, um, but you can still use the, the old versions um, as well. And so this is consistently through the whole standard and also in a way now that these bindings get automatically generated in the standard. So we will have this also for other future um, things that get, get added to the standard. Side effect was, of course, people always complain we have too many functions in MPI. We got 133 more um, because that all of them had a count object in there. They were all replicated. Now the standard had 133 function. Doesn't mean the standard is much more complicated because this is all auto-generated. This is wrapped. So it's not that, that you have to learn 133 new functionalities, but the standard if you had a file actually has that many more functions in there. So that's a big count, solved a big problem for the community and, and it's starting to be used and it's implemented basically by all, uh, all modern MPIs these days. The other thing that was added is for what we call persistent collectives. Um, as I already said, we started with blocking collectives. So if you had a broadcast or all to all, you did that operation, you had to wait until it's done, then the code was continuing in MPI 3.0. We added non-blocking collectives, so you could start a collective, you could do other stuff, you could wait for the end or test for the end, and with that, have the asynchrony in, in there as well. Um, and so this same thing can now also then, I'm sorry, and then for the point to points, we had persistence where you said, I want to do the same operation over and over again. Here's my specification of that, and then I can just reuse this, uh, this, this, this part, and this kind of helps here as well. So now with persistent collectives, you can say, this is a collective I want to do over and over again. Here are all the parameters for it. Please optimize for that. Uh, and so this is kind of, uh, particularly for collectives, really important because there's potentially very complex um, algorithms behind it. We have to create spanning trees, communication schedules, and things like this. If we know that this will be done over and over, it's actually worth spending some time on and optimizing. And that's kind of what Persistence Collective um, help us to do. They are mirror the non-blocking collective. So everything that is there as a blocking, as a non-blocking collective, is now there also as a persistent collective. Um, also the same thing for the, um, for, the, for, for the neighborhood collectives as well. You can now basically set this, uh, set this up one time. And so we have every collective, like a broadcast, there would be an MPI broadcast for the blocking one. There's an IBOP, uh, I broadcast for the non-blocking one. And there's a broadcast in it, which initializes the, the persistent co um, collective there as well. This one fixes then the parameters. The MPI can take that, can start optimizing with that. And then you can just reuse this over and over again. An example of this is here. So if you have an, um, a code that has an iteration, that has a broadcast and, an, and a reduce in here, so if you use the non-blocking ones, you would basically start an iBroadcast and an iReduce, and you would do a wait all at the end for both of them to finish. And you can do the same thing now in the persistent API. You specify these two operations one time ahead of time where you initialize them, and then you start the first one, you start the second one, you can, I can wait for them, and then you can restart them, right? And now MPI here, MPI would have to basically every single time you do the broadcast, figure out what are the parameters, set up all the communication trees, and here, this can be done once in the beginning, and we can start optimizing that. Also, that's in, included in most MPIs these days. I think there's still a lot of optimization potential. I think we see a lot of work in the future on this one, kind of how to make this more efficient and how to make this be, be used in more intensively. But the interface is there already, and you basically can then with that um, um, harvest any kind of future optimization in the MPI libraries. The other thing that came with MPI 4.0 is what we called improved error handling. Um, as you know, MPI initially is nothing anywhere close to fault tolerance. So if something fails, typically the whole job goes down. Again, that's something that's kind of was taken from the past. 
um, because there was not much to do if that happened. Now we have larger machines. You would like to have some more fault tolerance. As we've been discussing for the longest time, how to get fault tolerance in. We, we are not quite there yet. Let's just be really honest. But at least in the standard and with the zero, we started adding some features that allow us to reason about the state after after a fault. And so you don't you're not always just um, um, expecting MPI success to come back. You can actually actually get get um, errors back. You can localize these errors a little bit. You can also have new error handlers in there that don't automatically abort MPI. So you can react to certain faults in the state of MPI and kind of recover off that. Not everything, not full, it's not full fault tolerant, but simple things and loosely coupled connections, similar to what you can do with sockets, you can actually do with this improved error handling already. So point-to-point -point communications that with, with socket-like behavior works, simple master worker paradigms, you can actually do in a fault tolerant way with that. Um, and this kind of allowed us to enable a first use case. We actually had commercial users from the enterprise world who wanted to do exactly that, emulate sockets with MPI, and this is something that can, can work with that. But again, this is not full full tolerance for MPI. This is a, a, a step that's necessary for that. And we'll see full, MP, uh, full full tolerance probably in one of the next standards. We're still working on that. And this will be the basis for that going forward. The other thing that was added MPI for server that we also heard this this week a couple of times is what we call sessions. Um, this was a new way to initialize MP, MPI that was introduced also in MPI for zero. Um, and the tax and with the fundamental problems that we have seen in MPI over the time, because we have Comworld, it was a very static resource, will never change. Uh, we couldn't isolate different communication paths. There's no way to communicate with the runtime system, and also there's no way to, to as adult, with that also be limiting our way to kind of bring in new communities and new industrial applications. Uh, I know this is some problems that are from the very beginning, they're in the initial design of MPI that prevent us from doing that. And now you can say, why did they do this back then? Why why this is stupid of putting these restrictions on it? Well, it fit the time, right? Because MPI Com World was supposed to be a static resource to have minimal complexity. We had very simple machines. We had single threaded machines. We couldn't put much work on them. And so it had to be similar. We wanted to have the static resources because otherwise we would have had PVM back, again, with, with the appropriate overheads to that. Um, and it's the same thing for the other ones, right? So we didn't need to re uh, redo resources we didn't want to talk to the runtime system again to reduce uh, reduce complexity. And back then, these new application areas were not the focus at all. We're getting them in to some degree, but we still have to focus on HPC as well. right? So there was a good reason to do all of that, but the, the times have changed, and so we would like to see something slightly different. And so the question came up, how can we do this without giving up on the core of MPI, of the ideas of MPI, without compromising MPI and staying bad for backwards compatible? And that's where the session proposal came in. That's the reason why we have the sessions part. And so when you tell us, people are just a little bit disappointed. Session doesn't do much more than that. It allows us a new way to initialize, basically. Um, not much more yet. We will build on that going forward. And I'll show a couple examples of how we can build on that. But sessions basically is you can get an MPI session, which is a purely local object. You get a local handle to your library. You can talk to the runtime system to figure out what groupings of processes are out there. You can create a group from that. Local object has nothing to do with communication yet. And only in the fourth step, you will create a communicator. And with that, for the first time, get communication going in a, in a, in a collective manner across different processes. Um, and of course, you can, of course, you don't have to do this always for every process. You can have to create groups, you can slice and dice them, and only bring up exactly the communicators that you want. And with that, have potentially have a much more scalable behavior in your initialization. So with that, we can have exactly this information with, with the runtime system by communicating with the process groups here. Um, we can have the isolation because we can have different handles to different part of your communication. And also, we don't have to have a com world anymore. We can have a com world. We can ask for all processes, then we can derive a com world. But if you don't need a com world for the communication pattern that we have, we just ask for other sets or we can slice and dice our groups and we don't never have to set that up. And so this is kind of a compromise in there, how we can keep MPI as it is, but also have these new features in there. And again, it's a starting point. This itself, just this, doesn't help you a bit, right? It doesn't do anything specific, special, unless you rewrite your application completely. But it allows us to do some new things that we couldn't do before, and I'll show a couple examples in a second. 
And then we also added topology optimization. We added partition communication. And this is something that, uh, that, that um, Hugo and, um, and, and Christopher are going to touch on in a little bit more detail because they have, um, they're leading these respective efforts in the MPI forum. So there was MPI 4.0. Then we also added MPI 4.1 shortly after that. A very unexciting new version of the standard, I would say, because we did a lot of clarifications in there. We did cleanups. There's a, the standard is much more readable, is much more organized. So that was the main idea of that. There's a lot of work that went into that. And I think it really helped us then and helps us going forward, but there's not really major new features in there. The one feature that's probably worth mentioning is the BSend. So you can now do automatic buffering in BSend. So you don't have to allocate your buffer anymore. You can actually just use MPI's buffer into that. And the memory kinds, which, um, which Joseph will talk a little bit about in his talk. And but then after that, we're continuing, of course. We're already working on the next versions of the standard. Currently, what we're working on is MPI 4.2, which is supposed to uh, support an ABI. That's the big thing. We want to make this very contained to just one feature because that changes a lot of stuff in the standard. We want to have a frozen version of it so we, we can introduce the ABI and then we can go forward with, with, with new uh, functionality once we have the ABI in place. And that will be an MPI 5.0. So that's targeting a whole bunch of new functionality. And so there's a really good time right now if you're interested in coming into MPI, if you have ideas, this is the right time. We're starting to design the features for MPI 5. So again, please join us in the MPI forum. And some of the topics we're going through, for one, is we're looking at new bindings. In particular, we're looking at bindings. How can we do on the accelerator? And again, uh, Josef will talk about a bit more. But I just want to point out what the consequence of bringing in stunks for the accelerator is that we actually, and again, I forgot Rockham to add Rockham in there. So we do CUDA, Circular, and Rockham bindings. Um, that um, we have to have certain things run on the accelerator, uh, which means it changes our bindings. But these things were only designed to run on the host. We now we need a few other bindings as well, which run in a completely different environment. We need to specify that. We need to clarify what this works, how you hand things back and forth. And as part of this discussion that we started having there, they actually came up a bigger idea. How do you support other languages, new language that we can't do currently? So uh, C++. We had C++ a while ago. We got rid of that, and now people want it back, but in a better way. Um, and so, but Python, Java, Rust, he thinks, how can we bring MPI to that, but then not just make a C wrapper that basically forces everybody to use C, but how can we use the native pattern in the, MP, in the new languages to make this whole uh, better in the part? And so there's one idea is there, and this is currently being pursued. We don't know if this is going to work out or where this is going to go to actually split the standard into a core that defines the functionality of MPI, that has the central semantics, and then a whole bunch of side documents that explains the different languages. So you basically have the core of MPI, then you have a side document for C, one for Python, one for Java, one for Rust, one for Julia, whatever you need at this point, that then maps to the core semantics, but has these kind of more language specific meanings in there. And so this is something we're exploring right now. Um, of course, this would have um, you have to think much more now about what the semantics really are. They're not tied to a binding anymore. They're by, they're by themselves. How can we deal with scripted languages? There's a whole bunch of questions, of course, that's going to be I uh, have to be answered. Well, once we open that can of the worms, but that's kind of the interesting part of that. So it's very early discussion. There's a new working group. So if you're working with special modern languages and have an interest in MPI, I think it would be a very fun time to engage on this part. <laughs> The other thing was we're currently looking in for MPI 5 um, is the idea of extending the profiling interface. As I said, MPI had a profiling interface from the very beginning. Since MPI 1.0, we can write portable tools that work with MPI. Um, also, that um, has been great, but it had a little bit of a, a couple of drawbacks because you can only use a single tool at a time. And you can say, why do you need multiple tools? I know which tool I want to use. Well, there could be a system monitoring tool. There could be an optimizer in between and a tool that you would like to attach as well. So we now already have the situation on many centers. If you want to use a tool, you have to disable part of the system infrastructure to run your tool in the first place. And that's, of course, not a situation that, that's ideal. Um, so that you would like to change that. And also, currently, if you really want to write a fully portable tool, you have to write your tool in Fortran. And I don't know many tool developers who really like that idea. And so we're trying to kind of make this work that you can write a C, a C tool that also works on the Fortran side. 
And so this is kind of the idea then to revamp this, that you not have a single tool, but you can actually stitch tools together to, uh, transparently. Certain tools could be loaded by the environment, certain tools could be loaded by the user, certain tools could be loaded by an application even that uses some of these interfaces for its own purposes. And then basically you get the snake through the, uh, through the stack and then basically transparently can hook these things together. The code name for that is currently QMPI. Um, Q is not for quantum in this case. It's just a letter after P. Um, and so it's the, the, the successor of the PMPI interface. We'll see if the name sticks. Typical names have a tendency to stick once you have them out there, even though it was just a code name in the beginning. So we'll see what happens to that. Uh, we have a first prototype on this one. We're starting to write text up on that, and then we'll go have a discussion on the forum relatively soon of where this will go. Problem here, these sessions that I mentioned before, right? This was actually designed before sessions came into being. How do you deal with this? Where's the session in that? That's a really big open discussion that, that, that we still have. So that's where a session makes life really complicated. But then there's another place where the sessions actually become very, very nice. Um, and that's the, the last thing I would like to mention now, what we're also working forward to in, in MPI 5.0, we're looking towards malleability. So again, as I said before, we have this very rigid execution. You allocate a certain number of processes, you launch a job, and that job runs on that fixed set of resources. That may not be ideal. It may come on into a phase where it actually needs less parallelism and could give up some resources, or it would need more like we heard in, in the talk yesterday when you want and see to visualize it that we need some more resources to that. So how can you have this kind of flexibility in the environment to kind of adjust the execution based on external needs, based on application needs, right? And so have this kind of feedback loop where you have systems being monitored, measured, then figure out what the right resource users is and then adjust the resource users as you go, as you go on. And that also supports and much more complex workflows, of course, as as well. It helps us better deal with accelerators and things like that. And with that also, we can hopefully go after new user communities, which have these more complex workflows, which have changing usage of resources as well, if we can actually do that. But again, this is very much against the nature of MPI, because MPI, the idea was to be simple, to have communicators that never, ever change. And so we're kind of trying to break this up and just making a communicator changeable is definitely the wrong idea because then you're breaking basically any fundamental abstractions we have in MPI. And that's why we kind of need, need to find something uh, in between. So how can you be malleable and how can we get away from the world idea? How can we interact with the runtime systems to query for resources? And you really see where this goes. It's exactly the same list that we had as the idea for sessions, interacting with the runtime system, asking for resources, coordinating resources, and then also kind of changing um, things, not necessarily relying on ComWorld, but still keeping the basic look and feel of MPI. So that's exactly what, what sessions can do for us. And that's what the sessions working group is currently looking into that. Can we have a sessions as this abstraction? And the idea basic is once you start having a session, anything that's created from that session forms kind of a bubble, kind of a transitive hull uh, around that. And within that bubble, you can apply normal MPI, but you can have multiple of these bubbles next to each other, and you can pop a bubble too. And with that, you can get rid of those resources again, and you can keep everything else intact and create new bubbles as you go along. So this comes kind of the idea of, can we use MPI sessions as these bubbles? We can, have, we can move things forward with that. We can have uh, in the bubble normal MPI, and then we can basically, um, if you don't need it anymore, if you need to change something, you can invalidate a bubble and then basically maintain the state in the rest of the MPI. So that's one idea. The other idea where a session could be used is changing the process sets themselves. And you saw that yesterday in, in, in the talk um, from Yi, from the Max Planck Institute, who are playing with this dynamic process model where you have changes in the process set itself that you can grow and shrink. You're, again, you're not touching the communicator, you're touching something else that we didn't promise in the beginning would be static. There's always the idea, you, you touch something else, you change something else, but then you get to communicate and you keep that stable. So these are both options right now. We're discussing both. Both have their pros and cons, and that's something we're going to look into going forward. This is, of course, very difficult to do. So there's a lot of open questions that we're trying to currently answer. So how do you ch see that you need um, a change of resources, right? Who notifies who? Which versioning do you have? How do you know what's the current process that it was the old one, what's just the new one? How do you stay consistent at, across different uh, processes here? How do you describe a resource user? If you want to have more nodes, 
how do you describe that? You need a node with a GPU or without a GPU, right? So these kind of things in, in the discussion are kind of important. You need to be able to specify that. And then you need a handshake API that allows you to say, I need X, and then the random says, I can give you Y, and then you can negotiate basically in, in, in between there. And so this is kind of, kind of um, going to be a lot of questions that we need to answer before we get this proposal in a state that we can actually put it in the standard. But I think it's going to be really good to have once we once we're there. Um, and then, of course, the other question is how does this connect to fault tolerance, right? Because here you, you basically have bubbles that you can pop that could be also happening in a fault. You don't have to pop it yourself. The system could pop it for you, right? And so here is a direct connection to the fault tolerance proposals. And that's the last thing I want to mention. So we are we are working on fault tolerance. So as I mentioned, we have a first step in MPI um, four already with with the error um, parts, but um, the, the the current ones are too 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 heavy weight and the kind of um, didn't work that well. People have tried also very heavy weight uh, suggestions for MPI, and so we didn't get anywhere so far. But we're still very much the community is very much interested. So we have a working group that is very active on this one, and the idea is these minimal building blocks into the standard, we then can con um, construct a fault tolerance model for that. And MPI for zero said was the first part into that. And looking forward, there's basically three things in the room. One is a very fine grain approach where individual processes fall away. You get a hole in the communicator and you find a way to restitch it. You basically create a new version of your communicators that goes without these holes and so they can continue with that on an individual process basis. There's a coarse grained model and another proposal where something goes away. You basically blow away all your MPI state and you start from scratch, setting everything up, but you're consistent with that from the very beginning. And then there's this intermediate one where you can work on a session basis. This comes the idea of the bubble. You have one bubble, you have one process going away. The rest stays. You basically wrap a new bubble around it and you can continue the work on, on that part as well. So these are kind of the three different ways from very fine grained to very coarse grained and the session model being kind of in between. I don't know which one will win. With following the MPI form, it may well be that all three end up in the standard and the user can choose what, what to do, but that's kind of the direction we're going on. So we have an MPI 4.0 with really important features. I hope you all start using that. I hope you give us feedback on how well these, these, these features work. Um, we have an MPI 4.1, which offers some minor features, but also the, the, the cleanup for that. And I expect an MPI 4.2 in the not too distant future that has the API part into that. Um, nevertheless, there's a lot of research projects out there, still a lot of features that we would like to have for accelerator systems, for new languages, uh, for malleability. So if you're interested in that, please join us and then work with us in the forum. As I said, the forum is an open organization. Joining just means you come to the calls. And so if you're interested in that, please do so. If you have any questions, talk to any one of us here in the forum. And we can help you and, and, and we can help set you up. So this was my part of the conversation. We're now going to go into a couple of the more uh, more detailed talks. We're going to talk about topology, partition, and memory kinds, as well as some of the features in MPI 5.0. And Hugo is going to do the, the first part um, in talking about the hardware topologies. Hello, everyone. I am uh, Hugo Tabuada from CA. And today I will speak about uh, the group uh, Hardware Topologies, that is a group uh, led by uh, Guillaume Mercier in France. Uh, so what we have uh, done uh, on the previous uh, MPI 4.0 uh, uh, statue, it's to introduce uh, what we call MPI com split, right? Um, and uh, the function of uh, MPI com type unguided. What is that? It's quite uh, simple. Here at the right, you have a uh, the, uh, the the hardware seen by uh, HW block and uh, you can uh, have your communicator then you split him with uh, NPI unguided and you will have the next topology for example you have uh, all the whole node when you split the first time you will have uh, the two new mass if you resplit you will have uh, the new nodes and so on so uh, this is the unguided uh, unguided stuff and then you you make the MPI com type hardware guided that uh, we can choose the resource on uh, on what we want to 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 split the communicator. So here, if you use we split, we can specify here that we will use the MPI hardware resource type, and we want the new node. And so uh, when you 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 type MPI com split type with MPI com type hardware guided, 
we specified new node, so we will get two communicators, uh, one with the uh, the first new node and another one with the, 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 the next one, of course. And uh, the, the question was, oh, can we uh, know which um, MPI hardware resource type are available in uh, your implementation? And uh, can we split uh, the communicator in something else than hardware resources? So this uh, this uh, question are answered on the uh, current MPI 401. Uh, we had this functionality, MPI get hardware resource info. And uh, with that, we can uh, know which uh, hardware, uh, which um, on which hardware resources we are splitting. And so we also had uh, um, a new uh, MPI community resource guided, and uh, it's uh, um, um, a, a split that is based on uh, uh, PSET uh, names here. And if we see uh, here a little example. Uh, on the, the MPI info set, we can uh, uh, say, oh, we will use uh, MPI set names, and then we 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 have uh, names that are uh, at a URI, uh, URI format, and uh, we will split uh, we, we, with this kind of stuff. So uh, all long-term uh, items for MPI 5.20x, it's uh, how do um, we... Uh, we uh, have uh, explicit access to underlying uh, hardware resources. So, uh, uh, how can we manage for, uh, from, uh, for example, what are the distance be between the uh, two NUMA nodes and uh, how we can get uh, this kind of information? We want to add uh, some uh, memory types support, uh, uh, memory from a GPU or not, and uh, dealing with uh, uh, mapping and binding uh, policies. So. Uh, should we have to uh, standardize MPI exec or MPI run? It's one of our, our, our questions. And uh, another possible uh, design that we are working on currently is uh, that for now we, are, we, we create a communicator, then we create the request and we call the communication procedure on this communicator. And this leads to, we, we, we can optimize very well uh, um, the, what we are doing because the communicator don't know the pattern that we that will uh, be applied uh, when we call the, the a collective, for example. And uh, what we want to do is to invert the current way to use communicators. So uh, we will create a, a request to construct the communicator. We init all the communication operation, and then we will wait for the effective communication creation, and uh, we we can. Uh, optimize uh, knowing what the um, the pattern will be. Uh, I have a little example here in, uh, in C. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's still work in progress. Here we can see we make uh, MPI com and MPI request. Then we create a, a 2D uh, torus. Then here it's a new uh, uh, functionality that uh, we, we plan to, to add, but uh, the API is still not uh, it's, it's still work in progress. So here uh, we we request uh, for a communicator, a topological communicator uh, creation. Then here we will update the top, uh, the topological uh, communicator uh, using a big, uh, MPI backcast in it. And here you can see that we have uh, MPI buffer deferred and MPI comp deferred because here we cannot know what is uh, uh, what the value will be, but we will know that we can we will do a, a broadcast and even uh, we can also do a, a, a reduce in it on all the stuff and so we will know all the communication pattern then we will update uh, the param uh, the with mpi param register we will update what the what are the the values that we will use and then at the weight uh, then we can use the broadcast uh, we can use the the, the, um, the we can start and uh, and and wait, knowing uh, which pattern we will uh, have on uh, uh, which pattern of the communication and on on which uh, hardware topology we will run and so uh, match the uh, match both to uh, to uh, optimize communication. So if uh, you want to talk with us, the, feel free to to ask question and uh, and to go to. Uh, the working group. Thank you.
Okay, so hello from my side. I'm Christoph Nietama from the High Performance Computing Center in Stuttgart. And I'm involved in a few uh, working groups. Uh, here I will present uh, the yeah, shiny new things uh, Martin mentioned about the partition communication um, designed around point-to-point -point communication. So um, here's a picture to motivate our work um, in the partition uh, working group, uh, which was led uh, by Ryan Grant and uh, resulted also in a completely new chapter. Um, so the problem mentioned already is that we have more and more cores on our uh, nodes. Um, and this is uh, yeah, normally um, resulting in hybrid programs where we have MPI plus a thread model um, so that we can reduce the memory consumption. And uh, what you then do is normally you have a big data buffer which you are operating on and you throw a bunch of threads inside an MPI rank on it. And this will also, for the future, lead uh, yeah, to things which are GPU-bound or GPU-related, because there you have even more threads working on bigger data sets. Yeah, so what you are then intending to do is that each of these threads is operating on one of these data buffers, say on this uh, on the left-hand side in the green picture part. Um, that's uh, one process with four threads, and each of the threads takes one bunch of your big array which you want to send, it prepares it before uh, it will be sent to the second rank on the uh, right-hand side in the blue picture. And uh, as soon as the operation from one thread is finished, you are ready to send this data. But currently what you are normally doing is either you have to wait until the full memory is complete because you use MPI on a process level. So you would need synchronization between these threads. And this comes with obvious problems like load imbalance between the threads. Uh, or you use uh, our current uh, scheme for um, blocking communication, non-blocking communication on the thread basis, but then you go for each thread again through the runtime of uh, MPI, with, which introduces a lot of overheads inside because you need locking for the threads, for all the uh, message queues and all this stuff. Um, same on the receiving side. Um, so here in this picture, we have, all, for example, also four threads on the left-hand side and three threads on the right-hand side receiving. Uh, so you might have also different um, resource uh, on, on different nodes and you want to match, for example, sending four threads to three threads consuming the data on the, on the receiving side. And yeah, how, how can we uh, improve here the support for MPI? What we came up uh, was uh, the point-to-point -point communication uh, for using this partition scheme. Uh, it's new in MPI 4.0 and it extends on the existing persistent communication part, which we had already in the standard. But this was already mentioned because we extended this to the collectives, uh, but here it was also taken as a baseline because it reduces obviously already the overheads for initialization a lot. Um, what we now allow is exactly what was in the first picture. We divide a larger message into sub method uh, partitions. Um, we here have a static model. So when you initiate an um, PI operation for sending and receiving, you specify the number of partitions which you want. And that's then fixed for the lifetime of this persistent operation. Um, so you can assign, for example, four threads. You want four partitions, and uh, each thread can then work on one of these partitions. This enables us now, or the implementations also for the future, um, to do a lot of optimizations internally. Um, obviously, as already mentioned, you reduce the MPI runtime overheads um, because you don't have to go through all this locking stuff for, for message queues and message matching and all this. Um, then the second thing is um, when you would have had individual sends on the, in the first picture, like in the old model with all the additional stuff of regular sends, um, you cannot aggregate messages easily. Um, because of all the context you would lose. So that's something you can do now because you can mark individual partitions as ready. You can merge or uh, split them up as you like uh, in, the, in the runtime system. And um, a third part, which you could imagine is also we have a lot of restrictions on the standard model like ordering or non-overtaking rules for standard messages, um, which we don't care about for individual partitions here. Uh, so it's much more relaxed and allows for more optimizations in the network layer. <laughs> Um, yeah, so talking about this advantages now uh, for the implementations, how was it implemented? Um, we added two new initialization methods as already shown on one of the slides before, I think. Um, these are then for uh, send, uh, partitioned initialization, and for the re corresponding receive operation. Um, these two methods, uh, which I will show also on the following slides, they are not interoperable with existing sends or receives because, yeah, 
they have uh, lo lower restrictions as said for allowing this um, optimizations. So you cannot use a partition send with a regular receive, for example. Um, here just to outline again the optimizations. So that's the first one um, in the model when we have four uh, three threads in this case and each would do standard send operations. Everybody is hitting the MPI runtime system and all the message queues that's more or less going away because the partitioned uh, marking of the uh, the marking of the partitions is really really um, yeah simple and can be implemented by flex internally. The second thing is the message aggregation, which I already meant. So if you have a bigger piece where you have sub partitions uh, with messages M1 and M2, uh, so far you would have yeah, uh, them marked as ready. Uh, on one rank zero, for example, you would send them individually, but you are also free now to merge them to a single big message with higher bandwidth, uh, for example. And now to outline uh, the API. Um, so the details are in the standard, so I will not show them too much for you. Um, but what you have to do is, um, for the sending side, you have this MPI P send in it, um, which you call it the first time, this will generate you a request handle. And that's a specific partitioned request handle. So you cannot use it with other um, um, send or receive operations, which you might um, uh, have used or the regular partitioned uh, functions, uh, persistent functions, sorry. So um, as soon as you have this uh, request handle, you can start a partitioned operation with an MPI start, which is already known to everybody from the regular persistent operations. And then um, you can do in each thread these P ready calls on the sender side. So as soon as a um, operation of one of the threads um, has prepared his buffer part, uh, you can call the P ready and this informs then the MPI runtime system that you can send the memory from this region associated with this partition. Then when uh, then every thread has to call this, which is working on the partition so that each partition at once, exactly once, gets marked as ready to be sent. And when everything was marked ready, then you do a final wait or test to complete the send operation on this case. And you can repeat this process between MPI start and MPI wait as often as you want as with regular persistent point-to-point uh, -point communications. And when you are done, at the end you clean up um, your request with an MPI request free, for example. Switching to the other side, uh, that's more or less symmetric. The only thing we didn't, uh, oh, we, we should have changed the name of the P send. So it's on the blue box, look into the blue box. So there's a, a P receive in it, um, creating the corresponding request handle. Then you do the start. Um, and now you can check for partitions um, to be arrived. Um, so on the fly, um, it, the buffer must not be fully ready, but just the part um, for this specific partition uh, you want to see. And you do this with a P arrived. So you can call this every time. It's similar to the MPI test interface, so you will get a return value, um, a return, so you can check if the partition is there. And yeah, then when you have checked every partition, you can also do a MPI wait, but um, the P arrived are not mandatory in this case. Um, you can do also just a start and then uh, go to the MPI wait directly here. Good, so that's the outline of the uh, interface. So let's have an example how this looks in the code. Um, on the left-hand side, again, the sender. On the right-hand side, the receiving side. Um, that's in C, so I apologize for all the Fortran users, um, but it should be straightforward uh, to take over the example. So at the beginning, we have the uh, initialization of the request, and here I marked on the left-hand side partition one and count one. Uh, partitions one and count one. That specifies how uh, the layout of your memory is of the total message, uh, and they can be different. That's why I marked it, especially in red, on the sending and receiving side. So one recommendation we give here normally is that you use as many small partitions on the left-hand side, so high number of uh, partitions uh, for the sender because you want the uh, MPI runtime the, um, to be able to merge partitions on the fly. So you are much more flexible in uh, aggregation of messages uh, for efficient transfer. Um, and on the receiving side, on the other hand, you want a low number of partitions normally because um, every time you have uh, uh, a high number of partitions and you want to check for the arrival, um, yeah, you have to go through a long list if there's something there, which introduces overheads again. So normally you want to check for larger chunks to be ready to be arrived to reduce overheads. So 
And that's exactly what you can do with the interface also. Besides this, it looks really similar in the initialization to what we have in the persistent point-to-point um, -point communication. Then, yeah, we just continue with the MPI start on both sides. And then we have, in this case, uh, the example for OpenMP. So we can just use an OpenMP parallel region over a for loop. Now we go over all the partitions which we initialized before. Um, we uh, have to take care that the request handle which we got back before is shared between the threads. And yeah, besides this, everybody can work on his own partition. Um, so we do the computational uh, stuff, fill the partition, um, number i in this case, uh, by the thread. And then we do a P ready as soon as we have everything prepared, marking this as to be sent by the MPI library. And this can then either decide it's too little data to be transferred or aggregated already with some uh, other ready stuff. Yeah, and then after we have done all the marking, uh, we can just go through the, uh, in this case, a while loop. We want to uh, overlap something more. Um, so we can do a test on, on the request handle, see if every trans uh, if the transfer, uh, the local part is uh, completed in this loop, and then at the end, clean up in this case, the request because we don't want to repeat the full cycle, for example. On the receiving side, it looks a bit different. Um, uh, so here we have we want to check for each thread um, if uh, a partition is arrived. So we have a while loop. Uh, we need a new flag in this case because um, um, yeah, we will do the same um, overlapping at the end uh, here again. But um, we will uh, test also for the individual partitions, not only for the for the global request. So that's where we have the partition flag. And uh, in this uh, while loop, we constantly yeah, check if the partition arrived, um, which the thread should operate on. If not, we can do still some useful stuff. Um, and that's uh, then repeated until we are finished and we jump out and do the regular overlapping at the end. Okay, so that's for an example, how the RP is uh, used in a really simple way. You can do much more complicated stuff with it. Um, Good, and to show the benefits of this, especially for multi-thread applications, here are some simple data from a benchmark, just communicating between two MPI processes um, on two different nodes over an InfiniBand network. On the left-hand side, it's the uh, thing you already have with the persistent MPI communication. And on the right-hand side, you see um, the usage of the new partitioned interface. And what we do is just measure the bandwidth between the two nodes for uh, different sizes of partitions. You can emulate them with the old interface, um, doing this process per process, uh, thread by thread, and on the right hand side with the partitions. And as you see, as the number of threads which are used uh, for this scheme, um, performance drops for uh, using the old interface, uh, but on the new interface, um, the performance just stays constant. Yeah, so I hope uh, you see the progress uh, made here for multi-threaded environments uh, and start using the interface and the implementers also getting on uh, on with uh, doing more optimizations, even improving uh, this interface more. Yeah, good. That's it from my side. And I would give up to uh, Joseph Schuger um, talking about the new RMA stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be quick uh, so that we have some time for the, for the, for the panel. Um, sorry. So I'm I'm in two active in two working groups. One is the uh, hybrid and accelerator working group, kind of fusion of hybrid, which was MPI plus CUDA or HIP and accelerator. Well, anyway, it uh, it encapsulates both multi-threading and um, accelerators, um, and then the RMA working group. So <clears throat> this was mentioned before. Um, I think we Martin already uh, described most of it. The idea is that we can expose memory spaces to MPI and say, well, um, I'm planning to use um, the CUDA memory space in my application um, if when I create a session and MPI can tell you whether it supports that or not. Um, so that, that's the way we came up with um, for you to know whether you can pass this CUDA memory. Um, and you can also say, I'm only going to use CUDA memory, which is uh, the assert part here, um, because that saves us some work that we would have to do otherwise. Uh, if you don't specify that, um, we would have to check whether it's CUDA memory or whether it's host memory. Um, so if you 
if you're the more constraints you give us, uh, the better we can deal with it. Um, there's an example here. Uh, you use when you create an, um, a session, uh, you specify the memory alloc kinds info info key with CUDA colon device. So it's always um, what type and then uh, a constraint. Uh, we also have CUDA um, malloc, I think, and um, uh, unified virtual mem memory. Um, in this case, it's only device memory. Um, and then you create your session and you get that same uh, info key back. And then you can check if that info key contains the value that you, you're looking for. Um, this is for sessions. You can use a similar um, mechanism for uh, MPI init. So if you specify this in the command line, um, you can check the uh, info inf, um, I think it's called, uh, for the global uh, environment. Um, this is, uh, yeah, partition communication was already mentioned. Um, I'm not gonna, not gonna go into much details here. We've seen that. Um, the interesting question for the hybrid working group is the triggering of partitions from the device. Here, um, um, I think Ryan has been doing a lot of work and he had a presentation yesterday. Um, so I'm not gonna try to rehash what he's doing. Um, the interesting question for us is how how we deal with the request because the request has to go into the MPI uh, P ready um, call and um, it's uh, in some implementations it's a pointer so it points the host memory what are you going to do with that on the device hmm. we don't know yet <laughs> um, this is an active area where we're we're trying to wrap our hands heads around. Um, and uh, I talked about that yesterday. Um, how do we integrate MPI with uh, execution streams like a CUDA stream or HIPstream or SQL queue um, so that A, you're making less mis synchronization mistakes um, and B, we have a better chance of overlapping communication and computation on the same stream. Um, we have we, as in my co-author and I, we, we have our idea and there's other ideas and um, we hope to, we partially wrote this paper to revive the discussion in the working group. Um, if you have ideas, please come join us um, or just opinions, right? If, if, if you think that one idea is better than the other um, because it works better for your use case, uh, we're happy to hear from you. Um, and then uh, this has been around uh, for quite a while now and I've been slacking on it. Um, the idea is that we, instead of you polling on requests um, and potentially many requests, if you have a multi-threaded or multitasking um, application, um, you, these requests are managed by the application in the current form, right? So you have to poll MPI test uh, on them or you have to block the, the calling thread and by calling MPI wait, it's, uh, not really ideal. And uh, this, this came up in the context of OpenMP tasks. You have communicating tasks. Um, what do you do with the request? Um, so the idea was that you could just give back those requests to MPI and say, call me back whenever they're ready. So um, it's called the, some people call it the Hollywood principle. Um, don't call us, we'll call you back. Um, so this is what, what, what we do here. We basically, pass back the request and the callback and some data. And uh, once that operation is complete, we'll invoke the request and you can do whatever you want. And this works really well with detached tasks in OpenMP, just so as it happens. Um, you create a task down here and uh, mark it as detached. This, um, sorry, I'll see if I can mark this here. Uh, so you mark it as detached, which gives you an event. And um, inside the task, you do your I receive um and register basically take that request that you get here pass it back into um uh the continue call and then um we will invoke this callback here come complete once the receive is complete and inside that callback we fulfill the event um which then um 
releases this dependency. And that's the important part of detached tasks. If uh, the, the, the task will run to completion, it will exit, but the dependencies are not released until you tell OpenMP that this dependency is now actually can be released. Um, so this works really well. If you have a use case for this, please um, contact me. I'm happy to, um, we're, we're still looking for more use cases. So we know that it works for some, but we want to get as, as much coverage as, uh, as we can because it's, it's sort of an invasive feature in MPF. Um, uh, there's one more thing in the MP RMA working group that has not been mentioned yet, um, which is uh, dynamic counters. So this is, if you've ever heard something about notified communication, there have been proposals in the past um, you basically say, uh, do this put and uh, notify the other side that this put has happened. And um, people write proposals or papers, and then they never bring it forward uh, into the standardization process. Um, Intel is now actually taking that step. So I'm, I, I appreciate that. Um, we just started the discussion on that. Basically, um, you define a set of, of, of counters and then um, puts and gets that trigger these counters. And you can wait for a counter to reach a certain certain threshold. And that gives us um, a synchronization scheme um, that is in addition to what's already there in the RMA checker. And I've talked about this earlier, so I'm gonna skip this. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs>